Hi everyone and welcome to the Reef Resilience Webinar, Sustaining MPA Management and Conservation, What Can Make It Happen, Experiences and Lessons Learned by Chumbe Island Coral Park, Zanzibar. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Petra McGowan and I am the Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Program and I'll be your host for the session. This webinar is brought to you through the generous support of NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. We will begin the webinar with presentations from our panelists and we're going to end with questions from those of you participating. To ask questions, there's two ways you can do it. You can use the question box at any time throughout the webinar to send questions and we'll keep track of them for the end of the session. Or you can raise your hand during the question portion of the webinar and I'll take your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbar on the left of the list of attendees. If you're having any technical difficulties, trouble hearing or seeing the slides, you can also send a question and let us know so we can try and resolve the issue. So before I introduce our presenters, um, we'd like to know a little bit about who's calling in and what you do. So you'll see a poll coming up. Can you let us know the primary responsibility of your job? Um, select all that apply, MPA management, monitoring, planning, financing, or if you're not directly involved in MPA management. So go ahead and fill out the poll for us. All right, so this will help our panelists kind of know who's calling in and it seems like we have people involved in a variety of different MPA things and a little bit of you involved in the financing, so, so that'll be interesting. Hopefully you'll have some good questions for them. Um, I would like to now introduce and welcome our presenters. Uli Kolber is a marine biologist who's working as the conservation and education manager at Chumbe Island Coral Park. She has a master's degree in zoology from the University of Vienna in Austria. And before moving to her current position, she worked for several years in the Maldives, running a marine biology station at one of the resort islands. Our second presenter is Kevin McDonald. He has a business management background and has been working as the project manager for Chumbe Island Coral Park for more than three years. He has worked with community-based projects in Africa and South Asia and as a consultant and project manager for over 10 years. So thank both, thanks to both of our presenters and I'm now going to pass it over to Uli. Thanks Petra for the introduction and also for hosting us today. Um, both Kevin and I are very excited about presenting online and we are also very grateful to the Nature Conservancy for giving us this opportunity. So thanks again and I would say let's get started. As you know, coral reefs, as we can see in the pictures here, provide important ecosystem services, food, income and leisure to millions of people. But coral reefs are also among the most endangered ecosystems on Earth. As we know today, that both local and global impacts are threatening our reefs worldwide. Marine reserves and marine protected areas have therefore become very important tools to manage especially local impacts on coral reefs, with no-take zones being very effective in building up resilience, protecting herbivore fish stocks, and also speeding up reef recovery after major impact events such as mass coral bleaching. However, many marine parks created for their protection often suffer from poor management and they struggle with their financial situation as their economic potential is not fully realized. But think of it that way. If you have something to protect, you actually have something very valuable that people are willing to pay for. 
And with this, I would like to welcome everyone to this webinar where we are going to talk about sustainable MP management and conservation and what can make it happen. So within the next 40 minutes, I will start to tell you more about Chunga Island Coral Park, or in short, Chikop. What is it? And what are we doing? Uh, I will tell you more about our governance approach, our management plans, and I will also provide you an insight in our conservation and education programs. I will then hand over to Kevin, who is going to tell you more about the Eco Lodge and the operations. He will also focus on sustainable NP financing, and he will share experiences and lessons learned. Uh, we are also going to briefly share our thoughts about the replication potential of our project model. And I hope that we will have enough time um, for questions and the discussion after the presentation. So when talking about Tumba Island, I actually have to take you to East Africa, more precisely to Zanzibar, which is also called the Spice Island of Tanzania. And everything started in the early 1990s when uh, Sibylle Wiedmiller, a former development worker from Germany, came to Zanzibar to do a consultancy work on environmental education. And her report actually showed that corals did not figure in school curricula at all. Not surprisingly, there was very low public awareness on coral reefs, um, destructive uh, fishing techniques were going on in Zanzibar as well as along the main coast of Tanzania, such as dynamite fishing. Um, and even if you look at the word in Kiswahili, the national language, coral actually means stone. So um, it's actually quite surprising um, that there's no real word for coral. During that time, there were also no marine protected areas established in Tanzania. And moreover, no marine conservation policy institutions or legislation were in place to actually establish a marine protected area. Um, the good thing about the consultancy work that Sibylle did was that she also got the chance to explore the islands around Zanzibar and that she is a very passionate diver and snorkeler and sailor. She also came across Chunga Island, which you can see in the red circle. Um, it's an island located southwest of Zanzibar, close to the capital of um, Zanzibar, which is Stone Town. And when she was snorkeling in the reef on the western side of the island, she actually had a wow experience. Wow, because she saw a very healthy reef with a very high coral diversity. In addition, the reef was very shallow and easy accessible. There was no need to go scuba diving. She could see everything by just snorkeling in the reef. In addition, the island was uninhabited. There were no local communities living on the island, as uh, fresh water is one of the limiting resources. But the island was also a military area, and it's located uh, in the shipping channel between Dar es Salaam and Zanzibar. So it's also another traditional fishing ground. If you have a look at the list, it's actually something like a wish list for something you want to protect. And the settings and the, the location also have a high potential for actually creating a marine park. And if you look at the uh, local communities that are uh, very close to Chunda, it's also giving you an idea that through the cooperation with local fishermen, it would be possible to start a project like this rather than having the government enforce um, regulations. Um, now I would actually like to show you Chunga Island, and for this we are going uh, on a plane ride, and we have a look at Chunga from a bird's eye view. We are approaching the island from the south, and uh, even from the distance it's very easy to distinguish uh, Chunga Island from other islands, because we have one of the historical monuments, which is um, the lighthouse, which was built by the British in 1904, and which is still operating. Also from the distance, you can see the island is not very big. It's about 1.1 kilometers long and 300 meters wide at the widest point. Uh, when you come closer, you can actually see that the island is fully covered uh, by a dense coral reef forest. And uh, when we look at the reef um, systems, if we have a look at the width and size, this is where we find this very diverse 
hard coral reef uh, with uh, very large and old porites colonies. And the western, opposite of the western side, the eastern part of the island, and the reef system there is quite different because it's dominated by patchy reef colonies and uh, more sandy areas and far less diverse. When we continue to the northern part, you can also see that the eastern side is facing a shallow lagoon, while the western side is dropping off into a deeper channel. And you can also see some of the seagrass areas that are extending in the northern side of the island. So now imagine yourself back in the early 1990s, and um, imagine you want to protect this island and the diverse reef on the western side, but people are not aware of coral reefs, they are not aware of marine protected areas. So how are you going to do it? Well, Sibylla's approach was to establish a private not-for-profit company, which she called Chunga Island Coral Park in 1992, that runs on commercial principles. From the beginning, the mission statement was very clear that this company would manage a forest and marine reserve for conservation and education purposes. And this concept was brought to the government of Zanzibar, and because it was such a new approach, it took actually more than two years uh, of negotiations with different um, ministries, uh, with different local uh, fishing communities, until the government agreed to gazette the island uh, as a marine sanctuary in 1994. And even up to now, this is a very unique step because there are not many cases worldwide where the government is providing management rights to a private company when it comes to reef protection. As for the protection status, um, only the western side of the island is protected, and the reef is protected as a class 2 no-take area, and the reef management agreement was given to the company for 10 years on a renewable basis. Um, and in order to actually fund and finance a project like this in the long term without being dependent on donor funding, the concept of ecotourism came in place. So the idea was to start with ecotourism activities, which would be related to non-consumptive use of natural resources, and this should be the engine of the project. So you can see from 1994 to actually 2014, next year, we are going to celebrate our 20th anniversary. And you may ask the question, how have we been doing? How is the MPE doing? And to answer this question, it's actually quite interesting to have a look at the projects from a governance perspective. And we were actually very lucky to work uh, with Peter Jones, one of the um, experts in the area of marine protected area governance. And he was developing a framework for MPA governance. And he published a technical report. Um, the report was actually published in the UDP in 2011. And if you're interested in the PDF, um, it's available after the presentation. So without going too much into detail, the whole framework was about case study analysis. And Chunga Island was one of the case studies. And we've also published our results in a paper earlier this year. And um, the first thing I would like to say is that um, being involved in a government analysis is actually a very exciting uh, exercise. And I can only recommend it for any MPA manager, because it also gives you the chance and opportunity to understand your MPA better. And the focus on this uh, framework analysis is actually the um, incentive concept. Which, so we start with the governance analysis. And without going too much into detail, uh, the focus on this framework was actually on the incentives. So we looked at different types of incentives and how they can be applied in context of your conflicts and local drivers. And then it also gives you an idea what kind of incentives are actually needed to improve your MPE governance and where are the cross-cutting issues. And the ultimate aim of this framework uh, analysis was actually to assess MPE um, effectiveness. And for this, they developed a score from 0 to 5. 0 meaning that no, none of the impacts are actually addressed, and 5 meaning that all of them are addressed. And Chumbe actually scored a 4. 
uh, which shows you that uh, a private um, governance approach is actually working. So I'm always talking about we, 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 but who are we actually, and how is the company structured? Well, besides um, the directors, the builder, whom I've mentioned before, um, we are 43 staff working at Jumbe Island Coral Park. Um, there are only two experts, which is um, Kevin, who is the project manager, uh, overseeing all the operations and also especially looking after the business side of the project. And uh, myself, uh, who is coordinating the conservation and education uh, programs. So I'm actually working with a team of rangers and educators, as you can see on the pictures on the left side. There's also a team involved in the hospitality aspect and, of course, in eco-operations and maintenance of the eco-lodge. And Kevin is going to talk about this more later. Um, our administration is actually based uh, on Zanzibar off the island because it's easier to do logistics from there. Uh, a very important part is um, our advisory committee, which you can see in the left corner, um, where we are inviting village and government and university representatives twice a year for so-called advisory committee meetings. And these meetings are very important because we are sharing um, the progress and also the challenges of the project. And it's also a platform, uh, especially for the community leaders, to raise any concerns that can be discussed. So the ultimate um, objective of uh, the TICO project is biodiversity protection. You have to imagine that a small area of only 33 hectares um, is actually harboring 90% of East Africa's hardcore species. Uh, we have over 400 different species of fish, and the reef is also a very important foraging ground for hawksbill and green turtles. But not only the reef, also the island is quite an important habitat for different species, uh, such as the coconut crab, which is also quite rare in this region. And to actually protect biodiversity, as you all know, enforcement is crucial, and um, enforcement has been agreed in, with the government of Zanzibar through the Reef Management Agreement. And it's also outlined in the management plans that were developed in 1995 and then um, reviewed and updated until the year 2016. So how does enforcement work? Um, we actually work together with uh, eight rangers that are employed by the company. Majority of them are former fishermen. And they've also been trained by the company. The rangers are unarmed. Um, they patrol their boat on foot from the lighthouse. And our experiences shows that it's also very important that you demark your area which is protected because it's further reducing conflict with uh, local fishermen. The rangers are not only patrolling, they are also helping and rescuing fisher in distress if there is no other maritime service available around Zanzibar. And all the activities and incidents are reported in so-called uh, ranger reports, which are then uh, sent to the Department of Fisheries, with which we are working very closely. So we actually have data available since 1993. Um, on the pictures, you can see uh, the upper one, um, where our patrol boat is um, approaching a, a sailing boat, which is sailing inside the NPA. Uh, the middle picture shows you one of the demarcation buoys, which is also using a solar light, so um, you have demarcation at night as well. And the picture at the bottom shows you one of the poaching incidents, and you can see that this is mainly done by artisanal fishermen. So they are coming in either by snorkeling or with the canoe, trying to, to catch um, parrotfish and snappers and groupers. So in terms of um, sustainability, of course, we want to make sure that in terms of conservation and environment, um, research and monitoring projects um, are ongoing. Uh, we've had a lot of data and studies when the project started, but we are also doing continuously coral reef monitoring and seagrass monitoring. And the new knowledge is coming up every day, especially in terms of reef resilience and climate change adaptation. It's also important to be able to conduct effective management. Uh, for the habitat protection, you've seen the Chumbe is a small area, so it's important 
to work together with other areas around Zanzibar and also to share information and to be transparent in the things that you're doing. And for this, uh, this also goes hand in hand with our social sustainability uh, with one of the most comprehensive environment education programs in Zanzibar involving students, teachers, and community members. And we're teaching ESD, which means um, Education for Sustainable Development, which is very practical and hands-on. And we are not only teaching on the island, we are also going off the island and we are going into the communities and we are conducting workshops um, in terms of capacity building. And whenever, whenever, whenever possible, uh, we try to empower women, so we want to make sure that all the excursions and the workshops we have equally um, ladies and men in our workshops. So these two pillars of sustainability, I would assume, are very similar to other MPAs. But then what makes us quite different from other MPAs is that we also rely on economic sustainability. So the engine of our project is the Ecolodge. And Kevin is going to tell you more about the Ecolodge in a minute. Uh, but also think about the employment. Uh, I mentioned that we are employing 43 staff and we only have seven bungalows on the island. So this is one of the highest staff room ratios in the region. But um, the project, and especially the lodge, also represents the market for local produce. And again, Kevin is going to talk about this more. And before I'm handing over to Kevin, I want to share with you some pictures and images from our um, environmental education program. And here you can actually make pictures uh, from the field excursions. And one of the highlights is usually the snorkeling. You have to imagine that the majority of the students, as well as the community members, don't know how to swim. And that's usually a barrier for them to discover the world um, underneath the waves. But we are providing them with light jackets, uh, with clothing tubes, so it's very safe. And we really want to make sure that they see and experience the reef. And afterwards, it's really much easier to connect to the topic of reef and conservation. And in the other pictures, you can see we are also doing uh, food walking and intertidal walks. So everything which is hands-on and practical. And then apart from the field excursions, the community outreach programs that we are doing are happening in the villages surrounding Chumbe. So sometimes we just go into the villages, we meet under one of the main trees, we are getting together with the village elders, and then we are discussing different projects. Um, but we are also conducting workshops with peer educators. And it's very important for us to always also go out into the field and to relate the topics with issues that are happening here in Zanzibar. We're also experimenting with different education uh, methods and tools. And for example, we've done a radio show um, one year ago. So we've invited speakers from Zanzibar, from the um, university, and uh, discussed different environmental topics. And afterwards, uh, people from Zanzibar could actually call in and ask questions. So this was a very good tool to reach um, more people, and also it was a, a fun and good experience for us. So now I'm handing over to Kevin, who is going to tell you more about the Ecolodge. OK, thank you. So Uli has provided you with a background of the project and information about how the main protected area itself is managed. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the Ecolodge and about the, the financing of the project. A truly unique aspect of, of Chumbe is that ecotourism fully funds the protection of the marine park and forest reserve, as well as their extension to education programs. Chumbe is not dependent on any external funding in achieving our not-for-profit goals and is the first private not-for-profit marine protected area in the world. As you can see in the picture here, there are seven equal bungalows. We have a maximum of 16 guests on the island at any given time. So our project really focuses on low volume, high value tourism. Um, pictured in the upper right is our visitor center, which holds the classroom as well. If you look closely at the eco architecture and, and technology used at Trimbay Island, it is something truly unique. Each of the bungalows is designed to provide a comfortable stay 
while striving towards as close to zero impact on the surrounding environment as possible. They have been constructed using natural materials which are available here in Tanzania. If you take a look at the architectural the blueprint drawings on the slide, it will give you a better idea of their structural design. It's worth noting that each bungalow operates as an entirely self-sufficient unit. The island itself is made up of fossilized coral and there's no fresh water available. So the thatched roofs made from palm leaves in the guest bungalows, as well as in our visitor center, have been designed to maximize, maximize rainwater catchment during the two, two rainy seasons. The rainwater is then filtered through rock and sand and collected in cisterns, which form the base of each bungalow. So the rainwater is filtered through the rock and sand and then collected in cisterns, which form the base of each bungalow, as seen on the picture on the slide. To prevent any harmful runoff into the ocean, as well as to conserve water consumption, each of the bungalows is outfitted with sealed, dry composting units. The island is completely powered through solar solar electricity, um, which takes care of all of the lighting, the fans, the solar freezers and fridges, as well as the charging stations for guests and staff. And gray water from the kitchen is also filtered, preventing any runoff of nitrate-rich water, which is harmful to corals. If we take a look now, this is the base of one of our bungalows, the bottom being the, the rainwater system. And this is the upstairs where the guests sleep, um, and what we call natural air conditioning. The, the flap on the top opens up to allow a wind and to come in, and the bungalows have been positioned so that they optimize the catchment of the wind during both of the windy seasons. This is the, the rock and sand filter. Um, the base of the bungalow below that is the, the rainwater cistern, and here's the composting toilet, and the solar panels to operate the main education center. And then this is at the kitchen, our gray water system. If we look now at MPA financing, um, which is a very important aspect of, of a private marine protected area. Uh, the initial financing of the construction of all the bungalows, all re relevant government fees and overhead costs, was made possible largely through private investment, which we may see. The initial investment was 1.2 million. Volunteer investment. The private investment was a loan with a fixed interest rate, while the donor funding came largely from GTZ, but also from the Forge Stamp Program, Netherlands Embassy, EC Michael Fund, etc. In 1998, over four years after being granted an agreement with the government of Zanzibar to privately protect the marine sanctuary, the Eco Lodge was open for tourism. If we look here, this is the revenue from the Eco Lodge over the years. And you can see that initially it was it was quite low. Um, it took some years for for Zanzibar for Tumbe to gain recognition and for tourism in general to grow in Zanzibar. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, Zanzibar was still a very off the beaten track destination with very few hotels or tourism services. Recently, this has changed dramatically. And there are currently actually over 450 hotels and BNBs on the main island of Unguja. There are very few ecotourism operations in Zanzibar, and Chumbe is the only private marine protected area. Unfortunately, many of the coral reefs in Zanzibar's shallow waters have been damaged by destructive fishing practices and irresponsible tourism. As many of the tourists are drawn to the beaches and coral reefs of Zanzibar, the fact that the reef off of Chumbe is in pristine condition makes it a unique and sought out destination. With our rack rate being $270 per person per night all inclusive, and with a maximum of 16 guests on the island, Chumbe is a true example of high value, low impact tourism. Our average annual revenue exceeds $500,000, um, and our occupancy in 2012 was 72%. Our annual expenses are significant. Um, running a, a private MCA does not come cheaply. And almost all of our expenses are generated back into the local economy. Apart from the operational costs, 
which include all fixed and non-fixed expenses to keep the, the operation running. A significant, significant amount is poured back into protecting for both conservation and education purposes, the marine sanctuary and forest, forest reserve, which is the mission of the project. Over the years, Chumbe has, has gained many achievements and awards, and it's something that's helped to sustain the, the project with international recognition. Um, one of our greatest achievements is being a self-financed MPA and able to stay, sustain ourselves through equal tourism, as well as being managed on site by local staff. Um, we only have three expatriates, within two, including the director of three expatriates within the organization. So the project is very much run by local, local, local management, as well as with our advisory committee. One of our, our proudest achievements was in 2011, the recognition by the UN is a noted example for PES within the context of coral reef habitats. PES is payment for ecosystem services, and what this essentially means is the benefit through the financial benefit that through ecotourism has greatly exceeded that if it was, was utilized in fish as a regular use would be. We've also been the winner of TripAdvisor's Traveler, Tra Traveler's Choice Award for 2012 and 2013. Um, in 2013, we were named number one out of 25 listed hotels in Tanzania for service, and we've been ranked number one out of 139, 339 hotels in Zanzibar for the last year. We've been the winner of numerous world awards, um, and we are also certified as a long-run destination by the Seeds Foundation. We went through a very rigorous set of testing and auditing in order to be listed as one of the nine global, global ecosphere recipes in the world. If we look at our lessons learned, um, first of all, it's that natural resources much must be protected. As I think it's recognized by all the listeners of this webinar, the protection of coral reefs is critically important, and a lesson learned from this project is that private management can be a conservation success and also financially viable. The project is not driven by profits, but rather by the conservation and education objectives outlined in our management plan. Our guests visit Chumbe largely to, to witness the spectacular coral and marine diversity, and in our case, conservation and tourism go hand in hand and are interdependent. Chumbe works very closely with the local government, scientific institutions, and community leaders who make up our advisory board, and we meet twice a year. Um, to share ideas and to discuss the management of Chumbe's protected area. A second le lesson learned is that social benefits must be felt. There are many hotels in Zanzibar with offices and bank accounts located, out, located outside of the country uh, where they input a lot of their food and their materials coming in, they're all imported. And we strongly feel that in order for tourism to be sustainable and ethical, there needs to be a spillover for the surrounding communities and a benefit to the local economy. Chumbe is amongst the top 10% of taxpayers classified as small to medium-sized investors in Zanzibar. We place an emphasis on hiring Zanzibaris and purchasing all of our products locally and responsibly. Through the boutique on the island, we support a number of local fair trade initiatives and many women cooperatives. On top of that, our team members are paid competitive salaries. They have access to health care, loans, and educational opportunities. We have managed a very high staff retention rate in an industry where there is typically a lot of turnover. A number of our staff have been working there for over 10 years. Our third lesson is that the project must be commercially viable. Although Chumbe is not a is a not-for-profit organization, we are registered as a business and we receive no incentives or tax breaks for our conservation work or the education program. We pay license fees, et cetera, just like any business would. And for an operation to spend money on commercial, on non-commercial activities such as our education program is not widely understood or incentivized by the government. The price of eco technologies have dropped significantly in Europe and North America. But unfortunately, in Tanzania, that is not the case. There's a large investment in the solar equipment, solar freezers, batteries, controllers, etc. 
are discouraging as an initial investment if the cost is so high. And lastly, is thinking long term over over short term. Um, it was very important that from the start, Chumbe was planned as a long term project because if the reef was basically to be to be projected for a short term and fished afterwards, there wouldn't be much of a point in it. So we were very Sibilla worked very hard to to obtain the 33 year lease on the land and also to have the 10 year renewable agreement with the government to protect to protect the reef. On top of that, the initial cost, as mentioned before, in investing in solar equipment is one that's only realized is paying back over long term. Um, the cost is so high that if it's an investment for a short term, it would not be an economical economical decision. And we've, we've certain, certainly seen, especially three years ago when the power was off for three months in Zanzibar, uh, that this was a wise decision. What we're often asked is whether Chumbe can be replicated. And this is a, actually a difficult question to answer. Um, there are a lot of factors to take into place. And at the end of the day, we do believe that Chumbe is a model that can be replicated and that private management of marine reserves have been proven, with the example of Chumbe, to be possible, although there are several obstacles which may, must be overcome. The first is that it's not easy to find a similar location or setting. Um, Uli discussed some of the factors involved in this before. And essentially, tourists also want to, to visit the pristine reef environments, which are unfortunately no longer easily found. If the marine area that is being protected has been damaged, it will obviously have less draw and be less likely to be commercially viable. The political will to support the private marine protected areas will vary from country to country. As, as with the levels of corruption. In many cases, it is assumed that they would collect more in park fees, the government would collect more in park fees if it was managed and protected by themselves. Um, but with Chumbe, we've seen that this is not necessarily the case. Next, the capital investment required to start the project with Chumbe happened at a time when tourism had not really matured in Zanzibar and not picked up yet. If the project was initiated now, the cost for the lease, the licensing, and materials would be significantly higher. And importantly, for a project like Chumbe to be replicated, it requires strong leadership and long-term management. The founder and director of Chumbe, Sibylla Ryan Miller, had the utmost commitment towards initiating a private marine protected area in Zanzibar and the determination to stick it through no matter how difficult things became. Through close cooperation and engagement with the surrounding community, Chumbe is a project that many Zanzibaris are proud of and has served as a model for sustainable tourism in the region and beyond. OK, and we'd like to know if people have any questions. Great. Thanks, Kevin. So I'm going to call on, we have a couple questions, and I'm going to um, go ahead and see if our participants can ask them themselves. So Kimberly, I'm going to call on you first. Um, do you want to ask your question that you text, that you chatted to me? I'm not sure if you can hear me. Do you have Yep. Yep, audio? I can hear oh, you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was curious about whether the marine protected area had seen any significant um, scientific research done. Have you had a lot of researchers visit and, and have they determined whether or not it's got any spillover effects on surrounding fisheries? Um, has it benefited any of the other uh, fisheries in the, in the outside areas? Habitat connectivity, anything like that? Um, yeah, maybe I just uh, have a little bit of problem of understanding because uh, the connection is not so good anymore. But um, as, if I understood your question correctly, it's about if we are doing scientific research and if we are working together with uh, researchers, right? And Uli, have you had um, analysis on connectivity or spillover done for your site? That's the question. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned uh, during the presentation, we had quite a lot of baseline studies going on in the beginning when the project was, or when the MPE was established. 
And um, after that, we have an inventory list done for the different coal genera, for the fish species, and also on the terrestrial side. And um, we also still work together with uh, national and international researchers because chumbers quite often used as um, study sites. Um, so quite often we have uh, researchers, especially students, coming and they are comparing um, the MPA of Chumbe with uh, reefs around Zanzibar, which are not protected. And the topics are ranging from um, seagrass um, studies to coral reef studies, um, fish stocks, and usually the, the results are, are published and then shared with the wider community. And in terms of spillover, for example, we had a PhD student uh, working in the reef in 2002. And she had also done fish taking and working together with the fishing community. And this is how we could actually prove scientifically that the uh, spillover was happening from our area into local um, community areas. Thanks, Uli. So, so sorry, just to clarify, have you seen spillover effects or is that still being studied? We've seen spillover. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the next question I'm going to see if um, Jeannie can ask. Jeannie, are you there? Can you ask your question? Or I can ask it. Jeannie, are you still there? Okay, well, I'm going to ask. So one of the questions was, and sorry if um, there, there were some connection issues, but um, Kevin, what did you say the annual operating cost of the um, park is? The annual operating cost of the park are the expenditures themselves come up to roughly 200000 but it depends what you take into, into consideration. Um, so I didn't actually mention the, the operational expenses uh, because there are a lot of the indirect costs as well where we have our patrol rangers, for example, who are working to patrol the reef, but they're also working with the, with the tourists. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, we have another question here. Um, in the case of a no-take MPA having a management plan, Sorry, let me try to read. This is a little bit of a long question. Let me start with another one while I go through that one. So one of the other questions that I had was um, if you were to tell somebody interested in pursuing this type of model, you know, the top three things that they should be thinking about when starting to scope something out, what would they be? It's a hard one, but. <laughs> sure. Can you maybe try? Did you want me? Yeah, I, I would say basically from a sustainability point of view, um, one would be that it's, it's commercially viable and that there is there is a planned forecast for, for funding. Um, if there is funding from outside, those typically come with expiry dates. So to think of things long term, uh, commercial viability would be, would be a key aspect. A second aspect would obviously be the, the local situation, taking into effect tourism, um, politics, the way that the government works in a very unstable climate, uh, the sustainability of the, the project would be affected. And third, I think, would be the actual location itself. Um, so if, if the project MPA was to run to be financed through tourism, it would obviously have to be the ideal sort of place to attract tourists to come. All right, thanks. So I'm going to try to call on one more person who, um, Alfredo, okay. I'm going to try to call on you and ask, so you can ask your question because it's a little bit complicated, but I can try to ask it for you if, if we can't. Um, can you unmute yourself, Alfredo Montanez? Okay, seems to not be unmuting. So I'm going to try to ask this question. Um, so this is a specific case, um, and they say, in the case of a no-take MPA, it has a management plan, but the plan has not been implemented. 
Um, there's no kind of government financing. It has three kayaking and snorkeling business, um, but the, it's not, they're not operating in the most sustainable way. What do you guys suggest in order to work out a way to start a financing you know, mechanism plan to implement this management plan? What approach would you suggest to include these businesses into the management of the MPA and gain their trust? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understood the, the start fully. Uh, Kevin, I can't hear you very well. Okay, so I was just saying that I I didn't clearly understand the the first part of the the question. Still can't hear Kevin very well. Uli, okay. can you speak for a second yeah, to see sorry. if it's just his yeah. connection? Yeah. Oh, it sounds um, very far away. Okay, can you um, hear me? You can hear it? Okay, go ahead then, sorry. Okay, so um, in terms of there is a no take area and there is a management plan, but the management plan is not implemented. Did I understand that right? Yeah, I think it that I ha was having problems hearing. So go ahead and repeat that. I said I'm just I'm also trying to understand the question because it was not so easy to Yeah. To so let's try this. If you were trying mm -hmm. to engage what what would your be your recommendation on engaging businesses into the management of an existing MPA or gaining the trust of businesses? Um if you guys can speak at all to that from your experience, uh, yeah. Okay, so for businesses, uh, I think like it's tour very tourism to operators, in particular. Tourism operators. Yeah. Well, kayaking and snorkeling okay, businesses. Okay. That's the specific business owners they're interested in. Yeah. Well, I think first of all, it's very important that you think through your your concept because. Quite often what is happening is that uh, many businesses really have um, short-term views and this is something that Kevin mentioned as, as a lesson learned, that's something which is really important if you want to set up a project like this, is you have to engage businesses that are really interested in the long-term um, engagement into this project. And uh, I think it's also very, very important uh, depending on the location, um, that you make sure that the business understands about the conservation aspect. So if you're running a business that is snorkeling or diving and you only think about the profit, which means you're increasing the numbers of, of divers or snorkelers just to make money in a possibly short time, then the project is not going to work because you don't have this sustainability. So I think it's really it's really important that if you have different business um, partners that are that are interested, that you actually make sure that you come together in meetings and that you find out where are the common goals and and what are the, the different uh, interests in, in uh, doing a project like this. Okay, I'm thanks. sorry, I, I was cut off and I called back, so I don't know Thanks, Kevin. Did you have any specific um, guidance or recommendations in regards to engaging um, bit, like other tourist operators in in the in financing of MPAs or um, how best to approach gaining the trust of um, business owners that might be operating within an MPA to help them? help get their contributions toward that MPA management. That was what Uli was just speaking to. Did you have okay. anything to add yes, to I that? I caught, I caught the end of what, uh, of what Uli was, was saying, and I think all those points were, were very true. I just, there's one point that I'm a bit unclear on. Is it, so people who are currently operating businesses within an MPA to, to finance the MPA? Yes. Is, that's is that correct? Um, they're current. The, they're currently operating businesses, but there's no financing going toward any of the MPA management. 
Okay. Um, I think with that, obviously, obviously, they're, if they're operating, if people are operating businesses within an MPA, and if they're tourist-driven businesses where tourists are coming because of the the marine life and the natural aspects of the, the, the MPA, uh, it should be it should be basically quite easy to convince to convince business members within the MPA the importance of of keeping that area protected. Um, we do have that situation in Zanzibar where we have areas protected, they're protected by the government, but if the the private private investors owning hotels very much want to, to manage it properly and are, are quite ready to to invest in doing so. And I think that tourists as well are very happy to invest in keeping an area protected. With Chumbe, it's not a luxury hotel, it's not something swimming pools, um, but we are charging two hundred and seventy dollars per person per night on average. And people are paying to come to enjoy a spectacular reef environment as well as, of course, the service, the service, hospitality, the staff, the food, all these other things. But the primary reason is to, to enjoy a pristine environment, and there are a few of those left. So I do think that, that tourists are willing to pay into protecting, into protecting areas, and I think that businesses operating within an, in an MPA um, should be able to market that to, to their guests. Okay. So our last question um, before we are out of time is, in regards to stakeholders and communities, which group have you found most easy to work with in terms of ongoing outreach and management, um, which has been the most difficult? So out of your different yeah, stakeholders, I guess. That yeah. Um, one of our most important stakeholders are actually children. So school kids from ranging from primary to secondary up to higher education and engaging with, uh, with kids is always a lot of fun and it's, it's sometimes challenging but it's uh, one of the easier stakeholder groups I would say and um, in terms of typical stakeholders. Um, of course I can imagine that uh, especially when the project started and um, you have to convince um, the nearby fishing communities and the fishermen there that uh, it was not allowed to go to Tumba anymore, even if it was not a traditional fishing ground. But convincing them that this area is now closed and it's not allowed to fish anymore was, of course, a big challenge. And, and, and fishermen felt uh, they're, they're not a very easy group of stakeholders to, to engage with. But I think our experience has shown that especially through through meetings and again through this long term commitment. So the, the fishermen actually saw that even after two years, after three years, after six years, after eight years, we are still here and we are still um, keeping to our mission statement and we are providing employment and we're engaging their kids in education, so I think um, there's been a lot of um, benefit gained from, from engaging with these stakeholders. Great. Well, we are out of time, and I wanted to thank everyone for joining us and thank our presenters. Um, the recording of the webinar as well as the resource links um, will be sent out to the Reef Resilience Network email list after today. If you're not on the list and would like to be, please email us at resilience at tnc.org and send any suggestions for future webinar topics in that email. Also, tune into our next webinar in January where managers Jennifer Olbers and Mary Peters will discuss the challenges and advantages of using dive operators and members of the diving community to assess reefs and act as an early warning system to bleaching and other stressors on reefs in northern South Africa. Thanks again for joining us and thanks Uli and thanks Kevin. Thanks,